everybody and welcome to another episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking and we are at episode 80, Mixing Your Surroundings or Mixing Surroundings, that probably sounds better. So what I thought what we'll do is, um, since we just finished episode 79 in which we explained about eight different ways to approach um, the initial starting point of a design, I thought maybe we'll take the next few episodes and go through some of these slides. So this will be the first one covering the mixing your surroundings, right? Uh, again, from episode 79. And I'm gonna take the exact subject matters, which was Japan with uh, like a Grand Canyon and uh, Egypt in the snow, a uh, like a mosque in a swampy world. And the last one will be a castle on the waterfall. Now I'll take some of those and let's just do it for real. So let's, let's pretend they're an actual uh, design project and we'll sketch them out. Uh, in this case, I've only chose three of them. I chose the uh, the Egypt one, Japan one, and the castle one because they're they're quite easy to do, I think, and they're quite fun. And uh, and for each of these episodes, we'll also mix up the approach. For this one, we'll be starting with thumbnails and sketching, and for the other ones, we'll see. Maybe some will be collages, some will be um, painting straight off the bat, some will be maybe using contour lines and uh, all sorts of stuff, right? So that way you guys could get different uh, exposures of how we even start these things off. And that's the main focus of all these episodes is because the design's already there. I think that's uh, that's from episode 79 already. All we're gonna do is gonna make concentrate on the how do you get them started, the pre-production, the early first half an hour to an hour type of uh, process. And you're seeing that happening right now, with these uh, thumbnails. And they're a great way for you guys to, uh, especially if you're a student, to learn how to draw because thumbnails free up the, uh, the stress level or lessen the stress level. Because if you're starting with a very tight painting right off the bat and your brain is telling you this has to be really good, this has to be super tight, well, that could create a lot of stress. What thumbnail do is that it lets you make stuff on your own time, right? No one's looking at these, no one's giving you pressure on your thumbnails. This is you, yours and your creative process. And generally these are done in the privacy of an artist uh, table, right? You're doing it on your own. You can decide which thumbnails work, which thumbnails don't work. There's very little stress associated with it. And these are something we tell our students here to do all the time because stress, especially for someone who is learning, is a major killer in design because stress could make you not draw well, stress can make you not design well, make you not think well. Uh, all these things are not good when you're in a creative process. You want to be in a good mood, a very relaxing mode, and hopefully thumbnails could help with that. So what I've done here is created a big canvas about 5,000 pixels wide, filled it with a gray layer. I just took the lasso tool, the, uh, the marquee tool, right? Where you can select uh, and just delete out a couple canvases and use that as my little border to draw my little thumbnails with. Right? So very easy to do. And I like to keep all my thumbnails on the same canvas. This way I could look back at the previous thumbnails and kind of evolve them, get the ideas. So everything's kind of flowing organically versus having a single canvas per thumbnail. So I treat these almost like how you would draw in a sketchbook, right? In a sketchbook, you don't you don't draw one drawing, turn it over to a brand new page, draw another one. You kind of be quite organic with it, right? You fill every corner of your sketchbook with ideas. So I'm doing the same thing here, except in digital. Um, so yeah, I'm starting with the Egypt one. And what I've done here in terms of design is that I'm gonna mix a lot of the Egyptian type of popular culture understanding into a single shot. So I started with the whole pyramids. Now, in fact, you see the tourist photos, they take the um, Sphinx and the pyramids in the same shot because that's the general perception of Egypt or ancient Egypt when you tell someone, what do you think of Egypt when, you, when I tell you about ancient Egypt? I think number one is gonna be the pyramids. Number two is probably gonna be the Sphinx. Number three is maybe Luxor with the obelisk, something like that. And what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix all those into a single shot. So this is an entertainment past of a Egyptian themed uh, location in a snowy world, right? So I'm not gonna break them up because in the real world, Luxor is somewhere else, uh, the pyramids of Giza is somewhere else. They're not the exact same locations. But if you're building a video game, for example, you're gonna clump all those things in the very small uh, space. So the player could experience all, all of them without walking, you know, five days uh, to, to reach uh, each location. So yeah, I started with Egypt because that's the that's the first one to find the junior demo. So now I'm moving on to the, um, what am I doing? The Japan one, yeah, the canyon. In terms of drawing, Japan one is the hardest one to do because these Japanese castles are very complex. So in this case, in terms of thumbnail, I just mentioned earlier, we don't want to stress out, right? So I'm just going to capture the silhouette. I'm not going to concentrate on getting the perspective perfect. I'm not going to concentrate on getting the roof 
to be perfect because that's not important in the idea generation phase. I can always go back and fix them up, right? Perspective, fundamentals, um, anatomy, all these kind of things we could fix during the final phase, during the initial design phase. All I gotta do is get the major idea down. So I don't really want to spend my time or my, my energy um, making sure the roof of these uh, castles are perfect. That could go later. And those are kind of things that doesn't require too much uh, thinking. They're just very time consuming. And I want to save my time and, the, and your most energy for your creative process. So for the Japan ones, kind of like silhouetting the building out, good enough, you know, I sort of have this similar silhouette, boom, let's put it in a uh, Grand Canyon type of landscape. And that's all I wanted to do for thumbnails. Um, that's something I want to mention for those who are students watching. Building a confidence and having a good pipeline is so important. For our students over here at the school, oftentimes what stops them from putting something up on the wall or we're even doing homework to the full completion is a little bit of a fear factor. They're scared that what they've done doesn't look good. They're scared that if their classmates look at something that doesn't look good, that they, one, might not even never put the work up, or two, they don't even attempt to start it, or they start it halfway and they don't show it, or they stop the process. When you are learning, that's the one thing you cannot do. You have to not fear that you're doing bad work or someone else is going to judge you for your work. The whole point is for you to learn, especially when you're in a school situation where you're learning on your own. You can't be fearful of making mistakes or putting bad work up. And this is all very, very important. So what we want to do is, especially during the thumbnail stage, just have fun at it. Go try different things, try different approaches. If you don't know your perspective, your fundamentals, who cares? Do them in side views, draw them in front views, draw them in top plan views. All there are is putting your ideas on paper. How good do they look? You guys have a lifetime, I mean, all of us do, even professionals. We all have a lifetime to perfect our stuff. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is like, man, this is the best thing I've ever done. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a perfection thing. We'll never say that. I mean, you're gonna find very few professionals gonna be out there saying my work is perfect and everything's badass. Everything I do is perfect. No one says that, right? We don't say that. We're always learning. So for a student who's learning, well, get your ideas down first. Have fun so you fall in love with this business. Uh, I think for us, like we don't want our students to right off the bat start doing things that are like, okay, you got to make sure that this is this, this is that. Of course, we do that. They do that in fundamental classes, right? When you're taking a perspective class, that is very, very important. But when they get into the design classes, which are our term two stuff, they we don't push them to be perfect fundamentals off the bat. We want them to generate thumbnails. We want to generate the ideas, generate the, the thinking process. And then we take the second week to clean. So when you're learning, do the same thing. That's what these thumbnails are for. They're, they kind of have horizon lines, they kind of have an okay perspective, but they're not perfect. Not, they're not even close to being perfect. Those are things we do later. For now, right now I'm working on the castle over the waterfall. That's the most important thing. Let's put a castle over a waterfall. So I'm not, not really caring about perfect uh, constructions here. So. Um, yeah, the Japan one was pretty hard. You can see I did like one, one or two Japan one. And I moved on to like the waterfall one because uh, castle over waterfall is just such a cool concept. We have seen a variety of those in video games, so I just couldn't wait to like, get uh, thumbnailing on those. So, but let me back up to the whole um, fear factor thing, right? So, as a student, draw, 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 draw. Get a sketchbook, sketch, sketch, sketch. And when you're doing the thinking process, these are things you're doing it for yourself. Don't worry that other people are gonna see it. And if they do, who cares? This is your your work, right? You you gotta be able to put stuff on paper and build that confidence. And the most important thing, enjoy what you do. So if you're doing it for the sake of others, or like you only want to get praise out of them, like everything you put up, you have to receive a positive reinforcement for it. You're not gonna survive in this business because it's a harsh business, and a lot of producers might not give you that feedback. So what you want to do is enjoy the process. Don't be fearful what other people say about your work, especially when you're learning. Right? Professionals, we can all deal with that pretty fine, right? Because you get stuff rejected all the time by clients, right? So there's not there's nothing there to like, oh man, now I'm in a bad mood or something. But for someone for a student who haven't experienced that, it could be bad when they do something and uh, and someone say, Oh, that's not so good, and then that shuts them down. That is not good. And that can actually prevent someone from pursuing a career simply because they're they're afraid of rejection or making mistakes. When you are learning, the whole point of learning is to do things wrong, to make mistakes. So you can learn from that. Um, now give this a try. Maybe you're at home uh, right now, open a canvas and mix two cultures together. Take uh, Mayans and put it in uh, in the snow, right? Or take uh, uh, Spanish buildings from, from the 1600s and put it in a Arizona desert or something, right? They start sketching, just get your ideas flowing, enjoy the process build that confidence level up. You might have to draw 50, 60, 100 drawings before you start to get that 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 juice going, that, that flow in your hands going. And that's what it takes. 
watching these tutorials or you know just reading about something but never putting your hands on paper that stuff doesn't really help because you know i mentioned this many many times in the past that's like watching someone shoot basketball all day long like a like a pro basketball player but if you don't put your hands on the ball and dribble on the court ever you're not gonna be good at basketball there's no way you know what i'm saying otherwise the all basketball training camps could just be people watching videos for 10 years and then send them into the nba you know it doesn't work that way you have to play the, on the court um the same thing with drawing is that your first few dribbles you're actually not just first few your few thousand dribbles of a basketball is not gonna be so good and then you're gonna get better and better and better to the point where you're not even thinking about it the only thing you think about is playing the game exact same thing with concept art the first stage is you're going to make a lot of mistakes it's going to be very frustrating you're going to be putting perspective down it don't look right you're going to put designs down it doesn't look so right but the more you do it the better it will become so by your thousands one by your hundreds one right some some people get it faster than others but the average is generally in probably uh after a few hundred drawings or so maybe 100 200 drawings they start to go to the next stage uh, we see that with our students over here they always have these leaps of uh experience gains you actually see it quite dramatically you actually see a student doing not so well for almost say entire term and all of a sudden something hits is because the hours they have done in their sketching meets the uh, criteria for that connection to happen and boom they're suddenly drawing really well so that's just through practice just do this a lot and thumbnails are great for that they're they're stress-free they don't give you a lot of pressure you know no one's looking at them so yeah sketch and have fun all right so here i'm continuing let me take a drink of coffee real quick all right so i'm on my which thumbnails this probably my 10th one or something like that now when i do thumbnails i don't really plan how many i'm gonna do from the beginning uh sometimes you do one thumbnail and have the idea then that's good enough right something you have to do a whole giant page of thumbnails to get the idea you want there's no uh, right or wrong way to do thumbnails or how many you do so as a student though you do want to give yourself some kind of criteria so you're not doing like okay i'm gonna do a painting so i'm just gonna do one thumbnail and then i'm gonna go with that when you're learning you probably want to do quite a bit i say maybe five six maybe even ten thumbnails that way you just get that warm-up that exercise because the idea that evolves through thumbnails constantly changes sometimes you will hit a good idea on your first try but sometimes it could take 10 thumbnails before you get your ideas to fully flush out so when you're learning just do as many as you want you know until you're kind of your brains get a little tired and then you go back to and go okay which of these ideas is the best one that I go with uh, but do limit yourself in the real world we don't have the luxury of thumbnailing all day long we have in general just a few hours to generate these and then you gotta at least produce them right because thumbnails are something you don't show not in general you don't you can show them to art directors but they're definitely not showing production meetings or showing to like you know your, your exec producers and stuff they, this is part of your creative process not something you show for like what do you think of this idea you know it's too loose uh, in the eyes of um, say a producer type so you have to be able to self filter your own ideas and that's another thing that have builds confidence when you only do one drawing and that's your whole goal is to get to this one drawing finished what happens if you don't finish it or if someone don't like that drawing um what happens it could be a big blow to your confidence level like man i spent like 20 hours doing this drawing i spent all this time planning it and then you know you don't like it maybe they finish it or you don't get the uh, the the the, uh, the welcome you want from it and your whole morale drains now we're doing a lot of thumbnails a lot of sketchings you are already self art directing you are getting rid of sketches you don't like you're getting rid of ideas you don't like so you're training yourself to not fall in love with everything you do you're learning the process of illumination to how to get to a better design by constantly evolving your own ideas if you're only doing one drawing and just evolving that one drawing over time you could get stuck in there and you you you, you fall so deep for that for that uh, painting that if anything bad happens to it you know either on your own with with your clients you could totally get, get into a bad mood and perhaps not enjoy this process anymore and that's dangerous for someone who's learning so for us we're always assigning a ton of stuff to our students so that way they're never attached to a single image but rather think of this as a design process right because your goal is to make a product no product could come around i mean very rarely do products come around from a single uh, sketch right they evolve over time and if you're working in this type of industry you have to get used to that kind of thinking which is like all these thumbnails even all the paintings we do off of these they could all be rejected 
But that doesn't mean you go into a rage and start like going, oh man, I'm gonna give up in this business. This business sucks or everybody sucks or something like that. Who cares? Your your whole point is to get to the idea. And if your clients are good, they will guide you through that. They will guide you through your thumbnails. Maybe like this idea is quite not quite there yet, but it has elements that work. So let's evolve this over to the next drawing. Let's evolve the painting to the next painting. And so you're always doing that. And thumbnails is a great way to learn that process because you're forced to eliminate your own work, all right? So you can see here, I'm about 10 thumbnails, something like that in, in. I'm already kind of shortlisting the ones I like by putting a little circle and a number next to it. Um, I've done this in the past with my tutorials, you've seen. The reason why I do this is because sometimes I'm very busy and working on other projects, or sometimes working on three different projects at one time. So by putting a little circle next to the ones I like, I just remind myself what was working, right? Uh, even though it doesn't, it's your own drawings, you could probably figure it out with, by looking at it for a few seconds. But having that just saves you that tiny, tiny snippet of time. And a tiny bit of time save could, could uh, keep one of your ideas in check, right? Because sometimes I find that the more time I spend on something, the more I tend to lose the initial drive to start something. So when I want to paint something or I have an idea in my head, I want to jump in and boom, just start drawing and start painting. So. So it's important that I do these little shortcuts like marking images, writing a text. These are all things to remind me of where did I last leave off, right? Uh, all right, let's talk about um, reference gathering real quick because I did get a question uh, asking about how do I rec uh, organize my references. Um, the, the overall answer I give is that there really isn't a very uh, organized way I do my uh, references. They're kind of just organically put together and they date back even back to my school days, you know, some of my files are dated like 1996, 1997, and they're like 200K across, you know, pixel, I mean, 200 pixels across, tiny little images, uh, back when uh, 1024 was like the high res uh, on a computer. So I still have them. And the way I keep them is just over time, I, I throw them into folders that make sense. So if it's a Japanese building and I have a bunch of them, I'll put it under a category called Japan. And, and that Japan then falls under a category called city. If it was a bunch of hills in Japan, they'll still go in the folder called Japan, but they'll go under uh, another folder called landscapes. So over time, I started to have an idea of where all my reference images are. Um, now, one, now, how you organize that, it's up to you, but we'll give you guys a tip, which is, for me at least, I try not to keep too many images per folder. I find that once you start to get 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 images in a single folder, it's too hard to use because there's too many images to look through before you find the one you want. So what I do is I keep just a few hundred uh, per folder. That's still enough for you to have an overall uh, mental map of what kind of images are in each folder. So if you were to ask me, hey, find me some Grand Canyon uh, references, I already know where to get them. Right? I go to this, 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 this folder, I got Grand Canyon stuff. If you ask me to look for some like roots or um, old tree barks, I know exactly where to go for that. Even though they're not on the folder called tree barks or trees, I know where to find them. And in my case, it would be under something called ancient forest or, or Cambodian uh, temples. And those are areas I know I could get good roots from. So you, you can come up with your own system. Because when you have too many images, what happens is, you know, just to load them, it's too many. And two, your brain can't possibly memorize a folder that has two, 3,000 images and where those things go. So, and I experienced that in the past, what I used to do is, well, not even in the past, even right now, when I collect references, I have a folder called collect the new references, right? And what I do is I throw stuff in there. Like every every time I see something cool on the internet, or I see something on a blog, I throw it in there. And after about two, three months, there are literally about 3,000 images in this folder, like thousands of images, to the point where I have no idea what the, what the heck did I put in these folders. So impossible to use. Like during production, I don't open that folder because when you open, it's like 3,000 thumbnails opening up. I have no idea what to look for. So what I do is when I have a downtime, when I'm done with the project, maybe on a Friday afternoon, I'll open it up, go, okay, okay, man, let's do this, man. We gotta clean this folder up, let's do this. So get yourself a coffee and open up some subfolders and go, okay, this one is a picture of a fish. Do I, where do I put that? Okay, put that under animals. Next one, this is a picture of a space shuttle liftoff. Okay, I'll put that in my vehicle uh, folder under NASA. Right? Next one is like a uh, African mask. Okay, that goes into my tribal under uh, Africa, right? So these are things that I do. And it takes a while. It takes a good hour and a half, two, sometimes even two hours to organize those files. Uh, but once I have it done, then those images will become useful to me versus sitting in a ginormous folder that I'll never open. And then you end up with like 10 ginormous folders and I have no idea where, uh, where the files are. So, but yeah, in terms of organization, it's up to you. Uh, some people have asked what software I use to view my thumbnails. And I use something called ACDC. It's, um, 
you can get a light version i think for free but it's relatively cheap it's like 20 no not 20 i think maybe 60 dollars or something like that uh relatively inexpensive software very powerful it's also very fast so um but i think there's free ones out there like um ah, i can't think of the top of my head i think google has one but the ones I tried, they're, they're all like not as fluid or they try to do too much for you. Like they try to organize for you. Uh, I think the Google one does that where it sorts it by last time you saw it or something, which completely is a mess <laughs> when I tried it because all the files are like completely unorganized and it was all over the place. But maybe I wasn't using it correctly. I, I've been using ACDC since the since the first version, I think. So I'm so used to it uh, and that's what I use. Now, let me jump back to the demo real quick. So you see here that I'm um, taking the thumbnails, the three of my favorites. I took the Egyptian one with Luxor entrance. That's the one with two statues on either side. Uh, and then I chose the castle one over the waterfall and the last one would be the uh, Japan one And I'm gonna do a really quick color pass a mood pass over them I'm not gonna carry them to full completion in this demo You guys can watch the previous episodes for that kind of thing What I'm gonna do here is just show you the initial stages right the creative process itself uh, In terms of how to finish it. Uh, I think it's not uh, not needed at least in this episode. So and what I'll do is I'll spend, uh, now in real time, the thumbnails, the sketching phase took about 45, about 15 minutes or so. So let's just say just close to an hour to do. Um, these little co color comps, each one took about uh, 15, 20 minutes, not so long, right, just to get the initial color in. And then I took one of these paintings, in this case, the Egyptian um, uh, ruins in the snow, and brought that to a full completion. And that's the step in which we clean up the perspective, we clean up the... Uh, the mess, we clean up all the bad paint strokes and things like that. And that process took uh, about two and a half hours, just under three hours. So you're looking at a complete process of about four, four or five hours for this uh, for this thing. So in a studio environment, that's uh, that's that's plenty of time. You know what I'm saying? You could come in the morning, generate thumbnails, do a couple of color keys, which these are as well. And these color keys, you can actually show art directors. These are things you could show to your clients as well. And they're like, hey, I'm thinking about doing Egypt in the snow. Here's a quick comp. Um, they'll understand at this point what, what are you trying to do and if that's approved then you take another few hours to complete it uh, of course for those who are students out there don't worry about the time if these things are taking you 20 30 40 hours to complete then so be it because you are learning don't let time be a thing to lessen your quality right pros are generally under pressure and they're trained to work under that kind of pressure to work very very fast students not so much you are learning so the one thing you should be doing is putting the time into your learn if don't push yourself in a situation where you're like i have to finish this painting in 30 minutes where i'm not considered good that is the last thing you probably want to do our students spend 20 30 hours per piece on their homeworks so you can imagine you know when they're getting three three to four paintings how much time to take in duties so spend the time you know have the patience and it's so important to do that um, even if the end result doesn't come out super super good spending that time is so vital in the in the process of becoming a professional right which is patience right patience to to deliver all right so you can see here's the uh, i'm getting some references up of snowy mountains just get the colors in the purples of the snow i want to get that in um, and start just painting away the line drawing the line drawing here is still on top under a multiply setting but just getting the overall mood and the overall values and the shapes to start popping. So you can see in this one, the Luxor one, uh, you enter between these two statues and behind you will be a pyramid. Later, I actually dropped in the obelisk right in the middle. So it's almost like all the stereotypical things you think of ancient Egypt all grouped together into a single shot. Um, and that's helpful when you're selling a idea. So in this case, maybe it's like a Tomb Raider game or some kind of exploration game. And you're trying to sell new levels to uh, to whoever's looking at these producer types or uh, art directors and stuff. Uh, a painting like that could summarize pretty much the entire idea in a single painting. So they could be like, nah, no, it doesn't work. Or they go, hey, let's explore this further, right? And then you could kind of start figuring things out, like maybe the pyramids one location and Luxor somewhere else. But in this case, it's just a summary. So next one, moving to the castle one, uh, looking at the references. And also using this color palette, right? I like the waterfall they see to the left of this image, that kind of purplish green water. It looks great. And I actually end up using that as the uh, foundation of uh, the painting. And now I'm looking for some greenery just to add, because th this is such a classical fantasy piece, you know, the, the Western European castle on a green uh, plains with white snowy mountains in the background and epic waterfalls. It's just, it just kind of has that feeling. So I, I want to just capture that as well. So. Um, you know, not super creative thing, but again, this episode is made for you guys who are, who are learning to to put something down on paper that doesn't fry your brains up or frustrate you by say I have to do something different, I have to do something creative, and you end up actually 
doing something maybe not so good because the idea didn't go anywhere, right? So, and we find out for our own students, sometimes they try too hard to design something new, but ended up doing something that nobody understands what it is because they overthought the design. Versus, hey, Egypt in the snow, it's a great idea, it's not super complicated, and it's fun to paint. Our epic castle and epic waterfalls, you know, it's not the newest idea, but it makes you learn. So that's why it's so important. Once you have the, the ability to paint, to learn how design works, you can always create something more original, create something new, right? These are never meant for professionals, like, oh, next time you work on an IP, this is what you do. These are things I'm talking to for student types, someone who is learning. That's what design center is for, is that learn in baby steps. Have a big goal, but approach it with something that you can accomplish little steps and accomplish them well. Versus like, I have to do a brand new IP, I'm just a student, but yeah, I'm gonna design something and paint something that's better than all the big games and uh, movies out there. That's, yeah, just doable. Some, some might be able to pull that off, but it's very hard to teach that type of philosophy in a school because in a, in a class of 20, 30 students, probably only one student could pull off that type of uh, big scope thing. The rest will suffer. They'll, they'll do things that are just completely ridiculous and not so good because too many things to chew on, right? And I'll break that down further. I mean, why do we do these kind of uh, mixing worlds? Why do we take a castle and put it on a waterfall? It's because for someone who's learning, the amount of information that they have to process during the homework time or during the practice phase is massive. For example, you have to go home and do some production paintings. The first thing I do is, okay, you gotta do some fundamental stuff, right? For a student, I mean, in terms of the cleanup phase, you have to do things like horizon lines, uh, vanishing points, foreshortening, uh, third point perspective, atmospheric perspective, uh, scale, right? These are all things that are just part of fundamentals. You can't, you can't break those rules, okay? So that's one. Two, they have to think about, okay, I gotta now draw something. So they gotta draw that nicely, right? Penmanship, line weight, uh, flowing of lines, you know, these are all the, the fluidness, contour lines, gestural lines. So that's art type type of things, right? Then they have to design something. So they got to solve design issues. And, you know, what are you trying to solve? What are you trying to deliver to the clients? So they got to think about that. Then they have to either render it or paint it up. So now they have to deal with paint strokes, um, brush marks, uh, shading with pens, cross hatching, whatever you know they want to use to finish it. And then they got to think about presentation. They also have to think about mood lighting right these are each one of these is a ginormous category on its own it's like okay we could light this castle in a sunset we could light it in early morning we could light it so it's all in the shadows so it's kind of moody we could light it so it's bask in this beautiful ray of sunlight these are all decisions a student when they start one of these things have to be faced with and i just named probably seven or eight major factors so what we try to do uh, as a school is that we try to lessen every step i mean we try to reduce each step to its basics so they could chew it off and do a good job. For example, perspective is a simple two-point perspective, okay? Next, we do a uh, we do line drawing, but we do it with uh, everything with a pencil brush or the pencil uh, line. So we keep it nice and nice and fluid. We don't do anything hard edge. When we paint with lighting, let's do some simple lighting, light from above or light from behind, right? And in terms of design, let's choose a simple subject matter. Let's put Egypt in the snow. So every single step, they don't have to overly complicate it and stress themselves out. Instead, you take that baby step and you do it correctly. You do it right. And the end result is still something very, very interesting to look at. It's still creative, but it doesn't stress the students out. And that way they build confidence, right? So important. And I know I mentioned this many, many times in the past, having confidence, enjoying your work, the ability to produce these day in and day out is what's gonna make you a professional. If you just dabble this, get frustrated, work on it for a few hours a day, get frustrated, and you know don't do it for for a week and come back to another week and get frustrated or have something fun, then that's such a slow process that you're not going to be able to be competitive for to uh, in, compared to someone who's uh, a professional or a student who's training uh, under a professional setting. That they're going to have this mental thing, right? And when you're studying at home, for those who are watching design cinema, when you're learning at home. That's the kind of things you could do instead of frustrating yourself. Let's just do something fun, right? So hopefully, you know, this episode will help you guys spark some imagination or some ideas. And you can try on your own, right? Mix some stuff together, draw some thumbnails, get some coloring. And each step, just do it well, do it right, and you build that confidence. And we'll move on to something else on the following episode, right? Um, as I take a drink. Hopefully that makes sense uh, to you guys, right? Building the, Really, all of this is for students who are learning how to design, learning how to paint, learning how to, how to put down some fundamentals. You want to just keep your processes simple, but yet done well. Versus super complex, you're chewing off a giant major chunk of difficulty and 
reaching 1% of it or 2% and you give up, right? That, that's even hard for professionals. These, this is one of those things that is going to be forever with you in your career. The How do you start something? How do you finish something? How do you get something to look good? You have to constantly find that balance. And for me, it's always been like, choose the process that's relaxing, no matter how hard the difficulty is, you know, for, for the subject matter. I still some, start with something that's relaxing. In this case, it could be thumbnails. Next week, we'll do like collages, whatever that could be, yeah? So... Yeah, because the real world is a lot harder than this, right? The collaging, mixing worlds. It's fun for this episode, but it is not something you can use all the time. It is applicable to a lot of projects, but it is not used all the time. But in terms of thumbnail stage, what I'm doing here, that is definitely usable for many, many different projects. So next week, we're doing uh, what episode 81. That will be playing with scale, right? Yeah, playing with scale. So maybe we'll do a giant tree or something. And that one, maybe we'll start with some photo collage or maybe we'll start with um, just values on, on paper, maybe black and white values that we turn to color. Who knows, right? We have to think of a process that's fun to start, to get our ideas and uh, our creativeness going. And then uh, we can always clean them up. So, so now I'm doing the uh, Japan one, just getting the major shapes to read. The point of these thumbnails is not to clean them up or get the little details in the whole point is to get the idea down get the mood down get the initial lighting down and i'm using very simplistic lighting for all three which is just light from either left or right of camera and a little bit of a fill light coming from the other the opposite side of the key light and a little bit of backlight uh for for the uh, atmosphere that's it very simple setup so we're not doing any kind of like uh foreground lit up backgrounds dark or backgrounds lit foregrounds dark or light a light ray cutting the subject in half. Those are more difficult and the initial idea generation phase, um, I tend to avoid those for now, and especially if you guys are students, because that adds another layer of difficulty. So let's do one step at a time. Get the idea down first, design it out. Uh, once you like it, for example, if Egypt in the snow is something you like, uh, where you've done Maya, Mayans in the, in the snow or something like that, and then you can always do a few more thumbnails and start experimenting with more challenging lighting scenarios. Yeah. Because selling the idea here, the, the lighting doesn't have to be there, right? You, in fact, you can sell this entire idea, which is line drawings. Uh, but a painting will help, right? But I don't want to push the uh, lighting in a way that uh, it's so difficult to do that the initial idea might even get lost in the process. So, all right. So these three thumbnails are almost complete. These are very low resolutions. They're only, this entire canvas is uh, only about 5,000 pixels wide. So you're looking at a uh, painting that's probably uh, maybe 1,200, 1,500 pixels wide, if, if that. So they're pretty low resolution, and that's good because that way I could work uh, with them without getting into uh, super huge files and uh, using giant brushes and stuff like that. So they're very low. Um, but you can see I do paint them out. I need to make sure that if you blur your eyes, that the line drawing pretty much uh, disappears. And even if you turn line drawing off, as you can see I do once in a while, I'm just checking to make sure that the shapes are reading individually and they're being divided by values and not divided because there's a uh, line uh, separating them. So you gotta turn the line off or just blur your eyes. Uh, both works. So for this episode right now, you're looking at something that's being sped up uh, about 50%. So this uh, line phase and thumbnail phase took about uh, yeah one hour in real time, 50 minutes, something like that. Um, you're looking at it being done in 35 minutes. So it's just a little bit, uh, about 50% sped up. Um, towards the 35 minute mark, I will go into real time in which I opened up the cleaned up version of the Egyptian uh, ruins in the snow. And we'll look that uh, and go through that for about five minutes or so. Now, in terms of uh, design cinema, if you guys have questions, we'll probably be doing a Q&A after we round up these few episodes. I think I'm not gonna do all eight uh, scenarios, right? Because we have some that are called, like for example, art, uh, I forgot what it's called exactly, but art movements or art languages. Another one was looking at the real world. Those are part of the slides I'll skip. So we'll end up probably doing about five to six of these before we wrap up this series, right? And that'll bring us to a part of episode 86 or 85, something like that. And after that, we'll probably do a Q&A. So if you guys have questions, art-related, education, whatever, design, uh, put them in YouTube and I'll have our uh, staff go through them and we'll compile and uh, do a, do a Q&A episode um, following these, right? All right, so now we are, uh, no, this is not real time yet. This is still being sped up. So I'm just opening up those and uh, separating them out to their own canvases. So at this point, I'm gonna work on them individually, right? I have the idea down. So I no longer need them to be uh, on the same page, but you still can if you want. You want know, keep on the same canvas, doesn't really matter. Uh, but here I'm just separating them out and resin them up to, I think 2,500. So which is half 5,000, 2,500 is enough for me to get the second stage done, which is your secondary details, your uh, rough paints. And then for the final paint, I'll res them up to about 5,000 pixels wide. So right now they're just 2,500 and save all the files. That's one, two, three. 
and that will conclude the fast forward phase of uh, this segment here. So within a few seconds here, I think once we get to 35, we will go into real time. All right, let's see here. Do, do, do. Almost a few more seconds as I save these, adjust some colors, make sure they look okay. So, yep, so here we are. Here's our thumbnails and the three color comps in. All right, so now we're moving no more fast forward. We are in uh, real time now. I'm going to open up the thumbnails that we last ended. So, here they are. Now, I haven't touched them up. They look exactly the way um, I ended it. So, they're pretty rough, uh, about 2,500 pixels across. But they get the mood across, they get the overall design, but nothing's really there. There's no cleanup. So what I've done is um, we're going to do one of those cooking shows. I'm going to open up the final version of the Egypt in the snow and show you guys. So again, that step has been skipped because we have many episodes covering the, that type of thing. So here we are. All right. So you can see big, big jump, but compositionally is exactly the same. The columns, the, the statue, the, uh, the snow mountain where they are in the background, the pyramid behind it, all there. But as I start to clean it up, perspective has to be clean, right? I threw a horizon line in there. I threw some vanishing points in there clean up the one point perspective and that's going to start tweaking your elements but the composition has not changed that's always kept the same so um, let's throw this to uh, to full screen so you guys can see it bigger and zoom in here for a second all right all right so you can see right throwing some textures the floor and i want this to be really like a uh, probably like a tomb raider ish game or um, one of those just cause or something like that another type of game where you're exploring these new locations, not just cause the one on PlayStation 3. Uh, I keep forgetting too many games these days for, for what they're called. Um, but anyway, it's, like, it's kind of like a, a lower craft type of game, right? You're exploring these ancient tombs. Um, yeah, so it's quite fun. So we, we put the lighting here coming in from the left side of camera, kind of like a height lighting, maybe um, uh, maybe 9, 9, 8.30, something like that, right? Pretty high, high angle here, shooting through, maybe 10 o'clock. And creating this nice uh, harsh shadows on the uh, statues and the columns and just picking up the peaks of the pyramid so and you guys could download this image from my blog i'll put it up there as well as uh anywhere else we could you know, upload this uh, high-res image too and grab it on my facebook well i could put it there so you guys could get it off my uh, facebook account as well after this episode goes up so so yeah, so this was a fun one. You know, it took about two and a half hours to clean this guy up. It was a lot of fun because again, we got rid of the design thinking part. It was like Egypt is Egypt, snow is snow. All we gotta do is put them together and you get this kind of a very fun exercise to try out. And, uh, and you guys out there could try this, you know, Egypt in the jungle would be kind of cool, right? E Egyptian pyramids in like an Amazonian jungle rivers and trees and lizards running around and, uh, you know, big, uh, uh, you know, uh, weird animals and uh, stuff like that. That could be a very cool uh, look or snakes, right? Uh, pythons instead of uh, like cobras and stuff, right? Just mix it up. So, uh, yeah. So if you guys find this episode quite enjoyable. So next week we will, hopefully next week we should, we should be. I'll try to get all these done every single week then wrap it up in a month and a half, right? So next week we'll jump into um, uh, the plane with scale. Either we'll do a giant tree or the flying fish. Uh, what else do we do? Giant storm or something like that. They're all fun. They're all really interesting subject matters. So let me just open up all the stuff we did so far, right? Here are the, um, the thumbnails. We started with that. And uh, let's open up the, uh, what do we call it? The, uh, the little comps. Eh? Maybe we don't need to. So yeah, so this should be a fun episode. And um, any questions, leave us in the comment section. And uh, hopefully, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed all this. And remember, always to have fun and enjoy this. Don't have stress. Do this because you like doing it because it's fun. Don't do it to show other people or you know, get praises. Do it because it's super, super enjoyable. So until the next episode, I will see you guys. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the comments, all the supports. I'll see you guys in episode 81. See you guys. Bye-bye.